Hi, welcome back to Mrs. O'Gram's Maths. This video is leading on from the one directly before it in my playlist on differential equations to do with growth and decay. Uh, we're going to take a look at some particular situations that often get used in growth and decay models and how to apply what we saw in the previous video to those situations that are pretty common. So what we have on the left here is um, this proportional uh, differential equation. So it's saying that the rate of change of y, whatever y is that we're measuring, is proportional to the value of y itself. And then that becomes this equation on the right, um, that should be kt, I'll sort that out in a second, um, where y is equal to y0 e to the kt, where y0 is the initial value um, of the size of y. And then k in that equation is the rate of increase or decrease that we're seeing um, in our context. Right, so we're going to look at um, some particular ways that this gets used. But just before I move on, if you're not sure how this equation became this equation, just go back and watch the previous video on growth and decay. It's the one just before this one in my playlist. So the first of these frequently used contexts is in population growth. Um, and now it makes sense to use letters that match with the thing we're talking about. So instead of Y, we call it a P for population. So the rate of change of our population is proportional to the size of the population itself. So a bigger population will grow faster, is what it's saying. Um, and then that turns into this equation, that version of what we saw um, just previously. Here's an example of how we use it. So a population of Weta is modeled by this equation here. So dp by dt is equal to rp. Now we could have um, alternate letters used like this. So instead of it being a k, uh, we might be using a different letter like r for rate. So the uh, rate of change of that population is proportional to the population itself. And then we're given some other information that there were 20 wetter to begin with. This grew to 36 wetter after 12 months. And then we want to work out how many wetter would you expect there to be after 18 months. If you don't know what a wetter is, it's a um, type of insect found in New Zealand. Google it. Okay, so let's set up our equation. We have this uh, population version of the uh, growth and decay equation. Um, and we're told that the initial value is 20. So we'll put in that starting off value as being 20 e, R, e to the RT for our overall equation. Now we're going to use the information that we've been given in the question to work out uh, what this constant needs to be. So we know this equation is true uh, for there being um, uh, 36 wetter at 12 months. So if we pop that in, we get when t is equal to 12, so when time is 12 months, the population is 36. So we'll match up 36 is equal to 20 e to the 12 r. And you can use equation solver there, or you can go through and do it by hand. You'll work out that r is equal to 0 0.049. So then we're asked to work out how many we expect there to be at 18 months. So we pop in when t is 18. So the population will be equal to 20 e to the rate that we just worked out times by 18 for our t. And if you pop that into your calculator, you get 48.3. So that means that we would expect there to be 48 wetter after 18 months. The next of these common uses is for radioactive decay. So we have a proportional rate here. N is being used um, as the amount, so the rate at which the amount is um, changing over time is negative R to the N. Now it's negative because decay means that that value is shrinking. So if we turn that into the equivalent E equation, we get that N is equal to the initial value of N um, E to the minus R T. And here is our example question. We're talking about half-life of cobalt-60. Um, now, half-life is the time that it takes for something to decay down to half of its amount. So we, if we're told the half-life of cobalt-60 um, is 5.3 years, then in 5.3 years, it's gone to half the amount it started at. And then we want to know how long would it take for it to go down to just 5% of its initial amount. So we've got our starting off equation here. And we're told that we'll have half left after 5.3 years. So this becomes this equation. So half of the original amount will be there at um, 5.3 years in. 
So then we're solving that equation and obviously the n zeros cancel with each other so we get this equation here and if we solve that we get that r is equal to 0 0.131. Now we want to know how long it will take for that amount to get down to 5% instead of a half. So for there to be 5% left we need this to be equal to 0 0.05 of the initial amount. So again we're going to go through and solve that. So cancelling the n zeros we get this. Um, so this is our equation to solve and that will happen at 22.9 years. Again, you can type this into equation solver or you can do it by hand. And the third and final example of this being put to practical use is with Newton's law of cooling. Now this is when the rate of cooling of a, a temperature is often liquids that we're measuring the temperature of so that it cools down um, in a way that's proportional to the difference between the temperature of itself and its surroundings. So if you think about like a, a cup of hot drink, um, if it's in a warm environment, it's going to cool down slower, but if it's in a cold environment, it will cool down faster. So the difference between its ambient surroundings, the things around it, um, and the thing itself will determine the rate at which it cools. Now this is often used with capital T's and uh, lowercase t's so it can get a little confusing. So the capital T is the temperature and the little t is the time. So the rate at which the temperature is changing over time is proportional to the difference between the temperature um, as it is and the temperature of the environment that it's sitting in. And that becomes this equation here which looks a teeny bit different to what you're used to seeing here. So this is the temperature of its surroundings. That thing can't cool to be less than its surrounding temperatures. So it'll always be that um, temperature of the surroundings and then add on the bit that we're used to seeing here, the, the, how the equation itself changes. So let's see this as an example. So in this situation, we have a bath that uh, was run and it was too hot at 55 degrees to begin with. Um, that's not comfortable to get into, so we need to wait for it to cool down. Uh, so after two minutes, it had cooled down to 50 degrees. We want to know how long would it take to get to a comfortable 40 degrees um, if the surrounding temperature of the room that this bath is in is 23 degrees. So we start with setting up the equation as we just saw above just up here um, and then we put in the information that we know. So we have the ambient temperature is 23 degrees so that's the the temperature of the room. The difference between the starting temperature so T0 and the ambient temperature so that's 55 take away 23 um, and then E to the RT. So if we carry on with that we get um, we're just going to simplify that down to this. Now from there we put in the information that we know that after um, two minutes has passed, so when the time gets to two, the temperature will have dropped to 50. We can use that to work out the rate of cooling. So we put in the 50 here, the time is two here, and then solve our equation so that we have the, uh, the rate, the R value. Now we're going to use that to work out how long it will take to get to the 40 degrees that we want it to be. So we want t equals 40, that being capital T, the temperature is equal to 40, we want to know when that will happen. So put 40 in for our t um, temperature value, pop it into our equation where we've got the, um, the rate in here, and we're going to solve for little t the time, and again use equation solver to save yourself some work here, um, or solve it three by hand if that's what you need to do, um, and we get that the time is equal to 7.44 minutes, so that's how long it will take to cool down to the 40 degrees that we need it. So that finishes off you getting a glimpse of three different particular kinds of situations that these proportional growth and decay models are often used in. I hope that was helpful.